Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled American Indians in the American Cultural Imagination. And I'm joined tonight with, by Philip uh, J. Deloria from Harvard University. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the National Humanities Center. Um, oftentimes, I thank you for spending uh, time with us after a long day in the classroom. Now I feel like I need to double down on that appreciation because we all likely have online education fatigue, Zoom fatigue, staring at screens fatigue. Um, there, there's no doubt that your lives have been disrupted and uh, pretty much all of your school and your curriculum and your teaching has gone sideways. But I do hope that this will be a, an engaging way to take a little bit of a break from the coronavirus uh, reality and um, pick up some, uh, some resources and some conversation that you can use in your new teaching environment. Um, I want to, as I always do, thank my staff, Libby Taylor and Mike Williams, for their hard work in pulling together uh, the uh, webinar sessions as well as other activities we do at the center. Um, Libby is the primary point uh, with our scholars and, and guests in terms of putting together the PowerPoints and making sure that your uh, registration is in place and your certificates and all of the um, the bundled uh, information that goes with it. So if you ever have any problems at all, please reach out to any one of us and I'll be happy to um, to work with you on that. National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina, and we are very pleased to be able to host an annual fellowship class of humanists and scholars who, who essentially create the humanities. They um, do the research, write their books, do digital projects, have conversations, and really help us understand ourselves, our community, and our world in a, in a much more important way uh, through the humanities. Our education work then is intended to connect that world, the scholarly world, with the classroom, classroom at all levels, classroom certainly at the K-12 level, both public and independent, but also the post-secondary classroom at universities and uh, community colleges. And, and my hope, I think, for tonight and for all of our webinars is that uh, the conversation we have, the resources we provide, uh, leave you better informed, leave you uh, with the kinds of uh, understandings that you can infuse in your teaching and in your uh, your daily conversations with students of all ages. Unfortunately, the center, like probably most of your organizations, is closed for the immediate future, uh, but you can visit us through our website. We've worked hard to make all of our material uh, searchable and indexable on the site. You can go to nationalhumanitycenter.org and uh, see not only the programs and the work that we do, but also access the content. So, for example, if you use that search button that you see four or five uh, lines down on the left navigation panel, and you typed in American Indians, you would find resources like this in our American Class Lesson Repository, The Effects of Removal in American Indian Tribes by Clara Sue Kidwell, associated with UNC Chapel Hill. I do hope you find a all of our online resources helpful in this uh, this trying time. And again, that website would be a good place to start. Um, our Teacher Advisory Council is a big part of the work that we do. I see many of them in the room tonight, Lisa Pennington up in Illinois, Carl Rosen outside of Philadelphia, uh, Jenny Snotty and Amanda uh, Smith down in the Atlanta area. Um, I do wanna encourage uh, any of you who really have enjoyed the webinar series or other activities that we do to apply for that council. We've extended the deadline. Actually, it needs to be changed on my slide to March the, I'm sorry, May the 22nd. So we've extended it just a couple of weeks so that you can uh, secure the various documents and put together your application. If you are selected uh, as a part of the 2021 Teacher Advisory Council, we will be bringing you to North Carolina for a couple of days in the fall. This of course is assuming that our calendars are, are somewhat back to normal, um, but we would love to have uh, any of you and many of you apply for this and join us on an annual tenure. I also want to mention our online course catalog. Our next series of courses is uh, due to launch on May the 28th. Ulysses, we got your registration. Thank you. Please note that these courses are pre-approved in most states and also Los Angeles Unified to earn up to 35 um, PD hours, which translates into about five weeks of work per course. Um, we still have some slots available for each of the three courses that are currently scheduled to, to slated to run, and we'd love to have you join us. Thirdly, I'd like to uh, also mention the five-day teacher institute that we have scheduled for late June, titled Beyond February, Hip Hop and the African-American Experience. Uh, we will be working with 
performance artist and University of Virginia professor A.D. Carson on ways in which hip hop and uh, his recent record uh, can explore key themes of the African American experience. We still have a few slots left for this, and at this point, we're we're planning to uh, launch it and to uh, to have it uh, as planned. Um, please visit our website, and you can also find information about the scholarships we have available. Uh, we have uh, probably eight or ten different scholarships that are associated with different districts and states and geographies. And if you uh, live and teach in one of those, we'd love to have you join and come to the center in late June. As a reminder, uh, tonight's webinar is a conversation between Professor Deloria and myself, between the PowerPoint and the resources that he has curated to put together for you. But you're a big part of this, which means using that chat box, uh, registering questions, talking to each other, um, uh, responding to some open-ended prompts that we might have will be important. My job as the moderator then is to bring those questions for clarification to the conversation. And if I ever miss you or if for some reason uh, you slip past and I don't get quite to it, please please don't hesitate to put your, um, put your question back in the chat box. So as an introduction, uh, I want to again thank you for joining us. Um, it's nice to see many of you who have attended multiple sessions. I, it's great to see Selena uh, Asuna from Arizona and Stephanie Nero, uh, both participants in graduate programs we had last summer. Um, and I'm, I'm struck by probably the reasons why you've, uh, you've decided to join us tonight. And I think that's going to be a big part of the conversation that we have. So, uh, Phil, I'm going to unmute you if that doesn't sound too aggressive. I'm going to hand you the mouse. Greetings. How are things in Boston? Things are um, about the same as everywhere else, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> we can suddenly start to say that with some <laughs> level of certainty, can't we? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, well, I, pre I appreciate you joining. I've given you the mouse, and in a moment, you're going to walk us through uh, a really compelling PowerPoint. I enjoyed working through it uh, earlier. I'm going to back you up there since I think maybe Oops. you Yeah, that was, you that was me, obviously, like not quite mastering <laughs> the technology just yet. It's, uh, you leaning on your, your uh, keyboard, I get it. It, um, it was, exactly. Yeah, I'll get I, there. I do want to ask you one question before we start, though, um, and that is, you know, as a setup, I, I often feel, you know, we've got a room full of educators tonight of all levels, uh, graduate students who are TAs, we've got K-12 teachers, uh, high school teachers, middle grades teachers. And I think a lot of us um, in one form or another wind up unteaching students as much as teaching them sometimes. You know, we, we have to unlearn them the things that they've picked up and all the ways that we pick up information. You work with students at Harvard and they come to your class and presumably you teach courses on Native American indigenous uh, histories and studies and cultures. What, what would you say is the one thing that you have to unteach them the most when they arrive in your classrooms in Boston? Cambridge, I'm sorry. Well, you know, I mean, I think there's a sort of, um, one of the things I want to talk about and one of the readings that was on here concerned settler colonialism and just the nature of the kind of constant erasure of Native people. And one of the things I want to talk about tonight is the sort of weirdness of the omnipresence of Native people in American culture, but also their sort of invisibilities in many ways. So just as a little snippet of things I've been doing over the last couple of years, I'm actually writing about right now is um, I've been teaching the three-fifths clause um, a lot, um, pretty much in every class, because students, uh, in my experience, you know, have actually picked up something about the three-fifths clause, and they're 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 pretty eager to raise their hands and say like, I know what it is. It's about three-fifths and slavery and negotiating the North and the South and these kinds of things. And um, you know, I, I sort of step them through it line by line, and I'm always amazed and not actually not surprised by the fact that like the line, Indians not taxed, which is right there in the three-fifths clause, which shows up in the Fourteenth Amendment. Is completely new to most of these students, right? They don't actually think about Native people being involved in the Constitution in that particular sort of way. And yet, one could argue that the Three Fifths Clause really is one of the first political articulations of Native people as separate and distinct sovereign political nations. Um, so those are some of the things that that I've been doing a lot and sort of pushing the notion of sovereignty, of self determination, um, Native lands is. Um, being retained lands, not being given by the federal government. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. Once you start making a list, it just gets longer and longer. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for answering that uh, so directly. And I suspect that many of the teachers in the room would have similar stories. And as we explore this topic tonight, I'm, I'm interested in the way that, that that learning will replace the unlearning. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, 
you have the mouse and control of the, of, of the slide deck, and, and we're anxious to hear this. Great. Well, I just want to begin by thanking everyone for, uh, you know, for joining me tonight. Um, uh, as Andy said, I'm sure we're all spending a lot. I know I'm spending a lot of time online, and I'm sure you are too. And the fact of you're willing to do it some more is really quite nice. So I'm coming to you from Arlington, Massachusetts, actually, um, home uh, traditional territories of the Massachusetts people. Um, and uh, because we're here in southern New England, um, we always also sort of refer to the Nipmuc people and the Wampanoag people, um, you know, here in, uh, in the Massachusetts area. So here we go. So why is there an Indian figure uh, named Freedom on the top of the nation's capital? Why is the Boston Tea Party such a compelling icon in American history? Why is Pocahontas such a big deal? Why do we have Sacagawea on dollar coins? And of course, hopefully you took a look at this video. What kind of identity crisis might the singer Cher have been going through when she moved away from gypsies, tramps, and thieves? Uh, and started working with the Indian themes found in Halfbreed. And it's actually the first moment where I thought um, I would toss out uh, a sort of open question. Uh, what did you think of that video? And I'm gonna look and watch some of the comments. Oh, by the way, I am related to Vine Deloria. Vine Deloria was my father. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so one of the uh, resources that uh, that we invited you to look at was the, the video clip. But what did you guys think of Cher's Halfbreed? We'll give folks a minute to get their fingers moving, get their keyboards ready. What did you guys think of the video? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Arizona, yeah, forgot the imagery. What other impressions did you have? Yeah, the horse thing is crazy. The costumes are crazy. Um, it's this really interesting moment, I think, in Cher's career. And, and I'm, I'm kind of a Cher fan um, that, you know, Cher has a certain kind of, uh, you know, dark hair, a certain kind of look. Um, and I do think that Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves was one way of exploring sort of, uh, you know, her, uh, her particular look. Um, and that Half Breed actually ended up being, you know, another one. Uh, I'm also struck, I don't know how many music folks are out there, I'm gonna mention this a little bit later too, that there's a kind of a musical quality to that song or to other songs, right? Um, for music people out there, if you imagine a descending minor third interval with a kind of dunk, 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 dunk beat, you actually evoke notions and ideas about Indianness that are really quite uh, quite portable. Da, 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 Indians, right, there they are. Well, let's keep going a little bit here. Um, why? Did Mary Todd Lincoln's insanity take the form of a raging Indian haunting her at night? And I would point to my friend Leanne Howe's kind of amazing um, book about this, uh, a kind of fictional uh, dramatic poetry book. Why do Americans build hotels and movie theaters meant to evoke Pueblos? Why do so many people have those dream catchers on their rear view mirrors? Why do we have motorcycles and sports teams named after Indians? Why Indian werewolves? Why telepathically tailed indigenous aliens who are really kind of Indians? Why do movie stars want to be adopted into tribes? Why do hipsters still think it's cool to wear headdresses uh, to shows? Uh, and then this, my friend Michael Innes, uh, Jimenez, who sent this to me, a uh, sort of fraternity party in Alabama, pow out for power. Hard to know exactly what that's about, but I think all of this points to the omnipresence uh, of Indian people in American culture and society. Um, because when you go looking, you can find that images of Indians are omnipresent, really, in our society uh, and culture, rising and falling in popularity, but sort of always there. Um, and once you sort of point out this proliferation, I, I think then we're confronted with a cultural history kind of question, right? What does it mean that Indians seem so curiously central? Uh, to, uh, to the United States, to American culture. This is an old question, one that goes back to the Big Bang that actually started this nation. In 1924, when D.H. Lawrence completed his sometimes wacky, but I think often insightful book, Studies in Classic American Literature, he found himself circling around this question. He too saw Indians everywhere at the heart of what he thought to be the uncertain contradictions that um, for him embodied uh, America. So for Lawrence, Indians represented instinct and freedom, 
That's a pretty familiar idea. They spoke for the spirit of the continent. They were the wild thing against which civilization might define itself. And yet, that Indian wildness was the same thing Americans desired in order to sort of make themselves somehow whole. So these are contradictions, right? And they're at the heart of our cultural sort of matrix and we might ask where they come from. So what I wanna to do tonight is offer a quick tour of some various origins and explanations uh, about the place of Indian people in American culture. So let's start back here in the iconography of the 16th and 17th centuries, the Americas frequently appeared as an Indian and often as an Indian woman. So here's an image called the Vespucci waking America, I think encapsulates a, a series of old ideas. Um, I think it's worth sort of taking a quick pause and seeing what you see here. Um, it's a really great teaching text. Let's take for a minute and um, see, what, see what you guys can notice here. Thanks, Ginger. Ginger offers it as a juxtaposition of wildness versus taming of America. Manifest destiny. Absolutely. What else do you guys read here? Nature, culture, odd animals, nakedness. Nakedness. Male, Thanks. female. Exactly, they're burning and eating human being in the background. Exactly, so we can see, you know, here, America is asleep on a hammock. Uh, the species is gonna wake her up. So there's this sort of um, untapped potential here. There's a kind of laziness, uh, all these animals that are sort of sloth-like uh, kind of floating around here. The humans are, of course, savages roasting a leg in the background. If you look kind of closely over there, between the hand and the sort of sextant that he's holding, there's another leg that's been chopped off and is just laying there on the ground. As someone pointed out, um, the image is sort of split right and left, um, the left side really being European, technological, transatlantic ships, navigational tools, Christianity, you know, all of these kinds of things. And of course, America is a woman and is of course naked. Uh, America's nakedness in these kinds of images, which is a continual theme, suggests I think a certain kind of relationship between sexual availability uh, and colonial domination, right? These are familiar ideas that the Indian woman is available to the sexual desires of European men in the same way that the continent is available to their uh, colonial kinds of desires. In the years of the middle 18th century, both Europeans and American colonists use Indians to represent not just the new world, but the very precise politics of the American colonies. So here you can see in a British uh, image, this struggle netted out quite clearly. The half-naked Indian princess, America, cries out for liberty while Britannia responds, I'll force you to obedience, you rebellious slut. Uh, shades of Saturday Night Live, 1976, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Colonists up and down the coast had long histories of conflict uh, with native people, which took shape in beliefs about native savagery. Um, and those beliefs had a lot of, retained a lot of power. Um, but as American colonists tried to imagine a new nation for themselves, they increasingly came to identify themselves with Indians and in opposition uh, to the British. Oops, there we go. And this required, I think, a certain kind of rethinking of their ideas about native people. So in the years leading up to the revolution, colonists frequently portrayed themselves as Indians in political cartoons and handbills, right? The, to be American was to be an Indian, to be a colonist was to be an Indian. In fact, by a ratio of four to one, Indians represented the colonies more frequently than those familiar things like snakes, pine trees, liberty ladies, right, and other familiar icons. The Indian in this case is still uh, a woman, uh, usually a princess, and the same connotations of sexual violence are now turned upside down, right? As colonists insisted that they themselves were the victims of a kind of metaphorical rape. As you can see here, this sort of guy picking up the dress as the Indian princess woman America is trying to, is being forced to drink, drink tea. One of the best examples of this sort of new colonial elevation of Indians was the founding of the so-called St. Tammany uh, societies. Oh, there we go. So Tammany, by all accounts, was a native leader uh, who had sold land to William Penn. As early as the 1730s, elite folks in Philadelphia started to create myths about Tammany. 
and attach them to their hunting, fishing, and drinking, uh, drinking clubs. Uh, in this sort of nascent folk literature, Tammany emerged as this sort of interestingly uh, 18th century kind of superhero. And after the passage of the Stamp Act in 1765, the members began calling their hunting groups Tammany societies. And they promoted Tammany from this sort of mythic figure into the king of America and then to a national patron saint, um, as oftentimes happened with the sort of symbolism surrounding saints in different kinds of countries. So here you can see one of these sort of songs, Ireland and St. Patrick and Scots and Andrews and Welsh and um, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of things. And I'm not going to actually sort of speak this all, but I'll just leave it out there for you to read quickly one of these songs. You can imagine these guys with a big bowl of punch, drinking away and shouting and doing all kinds of things. There's a sort of environmentalism baked into this, right? That uh, sub the subservient colonies of the British Empire are eating things like, you know, root vegetables and oats and leeks and potatoes, but but the the colonists are eating free roaming food like venison and squirrel, right? So there's a sort of sense in which you are what you eat, uh, and to eat this sort of new food in the, in the new world right, is to be a different sort of person. So Philadelphians and Bostonians did more than just imagine these sort of national saint kinds of figures. They also put on clothes and costumes, and they paraded through the streets performing themselves as Indians in order to stake their claim to being Americans. They played Indian, as I've argued in this book, which makes a great holiday gift, by the way. Um, in order to assert a, a sort of dawning sense of themselves as free Americans rather than as dominated British colonists, right? Because who, after all, was more tied to the continent than Indians? So when co colonists dressed up like Indians, celebrated Tammany as their saint, suggested that their resistance to British authority was part of a kind of continental imperative for liberty, they laid claim to a kind of Aboriginal status. But at the same time, Indianness also continued to have those other sort of meanings, savagery, lawlessness, the wrong side of the social order. And in that sense, Indians also made perfect symbols for the kind of transgression of social order represented by the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution itself. So they were this powerful and evocative kind of, uh, you know, kind of figure. This is what you get when you go to um, Amazon and look at the reviews of the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, I, we could ask what was so terrible and so awful about that book? And, and I, I will confess, some part of it was a, a bit of um, theorizing that I did on page 21 of the book, um, which was a little bit of tough sledding, I think, for folks. But it's really the payoff to the whole argument. Um, and with your indulgence, I'll try to walk through it a little bit in a sort of visual kind of way, just to, to see if I can, um, you know, kind of make it, make it legible. So when we're talking about native people, so often we talk about them using the terms noble savage, right? Um, two sets of ideas. Indians are noble, citizens of nature, pure ecologists, happy communitarians, deeply spiritual people, or they're savages, cannibalistic, backward, primitive, etc. And those ideas clearly at play during the revolution, at play today, very, very familiar. But what I want to argue in that book was that the situation is more complicated because noble savage is a measurement of value, right? Good um, or bad. Um, <clears throat> and when Americans started play acting themselves uh, and seeing themselves as Indians, it seems to me that like this framework doesn't really quite capture what we need to think about. And so what I proposed is there a measure of what I called relative distance. So forget about noble and savage um, for a moment. Uh, think about Indians as being so distant from the American self that they might as well be not human, right? And this is not the same thing as imagining themselves as savages. Or imagine them as being so close that the figure of Tammany could be interchangeable with your average American patriot. And that's not quite the same thing as imagining them as being noble. So I try to use this sort of schema to complicate this Indian thing a little bit more. And there are, of course, natural affinities between um, these scales. It's uh, uh, pretty easy to think of Indians uh, as inhumanly distant from yourself when you think of them as savage. Or thinking of Indians as noble makes it easy to see yourself in Indians. 
But you might also imagine the other two sort of corners of this chart, right? An Indian that was both savage and close, like a fierce and canny warrior who shoots behind rocks and trees in a way that's unfair if you're a British officer, a Tea Party rebel, those kinds of things. Um, or an Indian that was both noble and distant. This is a very modern conceit that Indians in all their noble purity are somehow outside the modern world, and this is clearly just not the case. So using this line of distance, allows us to put some tighter definitions around the whole question, I think. In early American culture, um, engagements with Indianists have everything to do with, with sort of national identity and national um, kinds of feeling. So you can see on this line, my argument here is that we make identities um, uh, by naming people who are other to us in different um, kinds of ways. Some people we place at such a distance to be inhuman, um, some we name as being close. And then we bisect this scale uh, with categories of relative distance. So my sister is other to me, but she's relatively close, right? I.e. family. A resident of Boston is further away, community, right? but not so far as someone from, say, the Midwest, a region, or Europe, a continent, or another planet, right? The non-human. Men are closer to me than women, egghead intellectuals, closer than soldiers, and I could go on and on and on. But I don't really need to because I think you, I hope you see the point. Our familiar sense of social divisions, race, gender, sexuality, class, ethnicity, region, nationality, profession, these are all ways that we categorize and clarify and empower all of these different kinds of relations. And there's a bunch of them, right? They just go on and on for uh, forever. But many of these lines work best when they function not around an individual, but around a group. And one of the most powerful lines, as we see from our contemporary politics, is that of the nation, right? Nationalism, linking together environment, political identity, group destiny um, together. And thus, finally to the point, more than any other group in American history, Indians have been tightly linked with the particular lines that have defined the American nation. Indianness has been an evocative way to think about nation, freedom, and land in particular. And I think we can make a parallel argument that blackness has been equally important to American anxieties about things like labor, sexuality, self-expression. Uh, self These are two different kinds of racial formations, I think, that are really important. So if we go back and ask, why is Pocahontas such a big deal? Why there's an Indian on the Capitol, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she moves from distant Indianness to close Americanness, right? And thus her story becomes the founding myth of the American nation. Right? George Washington is the father of the nation. Pocahontas has a pretty good claim to being um, its mother. Same thing with Sacagawea, who helped Lewis and Clark open up half the continent, mixed blood child, um, et cetera. Of course, she belongs in our national coinage. Of course, there's an Indian princess on the capital bearing the name Freedom. So this is the sort of analytical structure, right, that I want us to sort of start um, by, uh, by thinking Professor, about. That. Professor, yeah. before we move on, I, I wonder if I can ask a clarifying question. Um, you may indeed. So the the way that you've organized this 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 graphic organizer is really helpful, and it seems to be primarily from and maybe this is the intent of tonight's talk and the work that you're describing. It seems to be from the American perspective solely. Is there any influence uh, from the self awareness of the native perspective in this, or is this are we just looking at it from one side of, of the coin? You know, for the moment, I'm really going to like focus in on the American side yeah. Um, yeah. because I think it is really kind of a um, a mystery, right? Um, there are things that are just unexplainable. Like, why can you have a football team in the nation's capital that takes, you know, an Indian person as a, you know, as a mascot when you could not do that with other other kinds of racial or ethnic groups, right? And there's a whole bunch of really stupid and superficial explanations for this, but I think it's a very, very deep kind of uh, question that really cuts to the heart of American culture. What I want to think about as we move towards, towards the conclusion is to think a bit more about how Indian people actually live and have to interact in this kind of world and how they make sense of these kinds of things. Great, and I've got one more question. Uh, and as, I'm, as we're speaking, there may be some folks in the room who's, who are gonna chime in as well. Um, clarify for us again, we've got a group of educators who are representing this content to younger people. Uh, what is the correct terminology? Uh, I've heard you use American Indian, uh, Native American, Native. What what is the sort of the difference between and the and the way and what are the choices you're making in using those terms? 
Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, you know, I, I try to move interchangeably between them, between Native, Native American, American Indian, Indian, Indigenous, um, uh, sometimes with uh, Canada, First Nations. I mean, obviously, always in Canada with, you know, First Nations. Um, he, here's what I would say is uh, a, most Native people have really adopted although not all have adopted Indian as a kind of generic marker. When we have a chance to sort of use tribal markers and tribal names, we always try to do that. Um, so if we're talking about Lakota people, we don't want to talk about Indians, we want to talk about Lakota people. Um, uh, Native and Indian are sort of, I think, roughly equivalent and sort of slightly interchangeable. Um, you can really date uh, the uses of these terms. Native American really became popular in the late 60s in the sort of context of sort of white ethnicities kinds of uh, things, Irish American, Italian American, oh, Native American, African American. Um, you know, so if you were to, for example, look at uh, a whole series of Native American organizations, you'd find, oh, 1911, American in Society of American Indians, uh, 1940s, National Congress of American Indians. These are Native people sort of naming their own organizations. Early 70s, Native American Rights Fund. Um, you know, so there you see that kind of moment. Uh, later 70s, American Indian Science and Engineering Society. We're back to American Indian. Um, indigenous tends to have a lot of traction in terms of the global indigenous. Um, so we're talking about indigenous people across the globe. Um, Maori people, Aboriginal Australians, Aboriginal Taiwanese. Um, you know, indigenous tends to be the word that gets used. Some people use indigenous um, in a much more sort of domestic context, but there's other tribal people who say, no, 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 that's that's really not a word, you know, for us. So all these things are a little bit at play, um, but I don't think, uh, you know, I've had students who, who've come in and said, like, hey, my teacher told me I could never say Indian, it's derogatory. I, I think that's really not, um, I think that's not really right. Great, thank you. You're so welcome. Um, yeah, so, okay, so manifest destiny, right? Um, so the United States is quite literally built on Indian land. Uh, and white Americans imagine Indians, as we've seen, as both these sort of distant savages to be conquered and close American selves to be experienced. So to build the nation, you had to devalue Indians and call them savages. And yet, uh, to continue being American and not British, Indian people and Indian ideas and representations had to be valued and claims. And that's the contradiction that's at the heart of American identity and culture. It's never really, really gone away. So one of the theories that we used to, um, to talk about this um, today is called settler colonial theory. And I ask you to read a little bit of uh, uh, Lorenzo Veracini's introduction. This is kind of a gateway text um, to thinking about uh, settler colonialism. And just as a set of references here, um, it's one of the first places it appears in the kind of go-to references, Patrick Wolf's original article, interestingly, published in the Journal of Genocide Studies. Veracini's book, which is a nice overview, Settler Colonial Studies has its own journal. Um, I particularly like this article by Evelyn Nakano glenn uh, which is sort of a comparative uh, kind of thing. Um, so these are all parts of settler colonial theory. And what it would tell us this is the common buzzword, settler colonialism. It's a structure, not an event, which is to say it happens over and over and over again through a series of events that create something which is a structure, long-lived, long-lasting, sort of um, kind of impervious. Um, it turns the focus in traditional colonialism from the question of labor to the question of land. And one of the arguments in settler colonialism is that settlers come to stay, they found new political orders like the United States of America, right? Like Australia, like New Zealand. Um, and the settlers end up triangulating between themselves on the one hand, the indigenous that sits out in front of them and the countries of origin that sits behind them. And that leads them to create certain kinds of logics that take shape in their culture and their social and political practices. A logic of elimination, like literally getting rid of indigenous peoples, a logic of replacement, putting themselves back into the place of the indigenous, and then a logic of erasure, right, of forgetting all of that history, right, that has unfolded. So it's a very powerful theoretical tool for us to think about um, these things. Um, and I want to just turn and sort of give you a quick couple of quick examples uh, of how this actually plays out. Um, 
I think it's really interesting thinking about the modes of land taking, settler colonial land taking the United States engages in. So if we go back to the beginning, when you think about a nation to nation relationship that native peoples have with uh, European and an American governments. I think this goes to the three fifths clause um, question that we talked about a little bit um, at the beginning. So this is about um, putting savages on the other side, about making treaties with them. The relationship is diplomacy, clear boundary lines, these kinds of things. Um, and you can see this is sort of how the colonies imagine themselves sort of spreading out. A second mode though has to do with regional consolidation, right? Um, so when we're teaching the Northwest Ordinance, for example, or the Land Ordinance of 1785, these are uh, kind of pieces of legislation that are all about sort of taking Indian land. They are imperial and colonial pieces of legislation. So the idea, of course, um, you know, uh, behind the Northwest Ordinance is how you move from being a colony to a state, and you do that demographically by getting a lot of people in there and settling on parcels of land. But in order to do that, you kind of have to get rid of your Indians. So one way to do it is to remove them. Um, and another way is to consolidate and compress them on reservations. And here you can see an example in North Dakota, squash all your Indian people down into one very discrete sort of holding area and then open up all the rest of their land so other people can join in. And you look at the national map and you can see exactly how these two things play out. The South American Southeast, where removal was really the sort of mode, there's hardly, there's, there's no Indian people in terms of reservations or hardly any um, there. And in the West, a little bit later, you can see how reservation containment ends up happening. And then once you take those reservations, then there's another way to sort of take Indian land, which is to slice them up into 160 acre parcels, right? Um, desegregate and disaggregate that land, which rests upon a notion of pacification, that Indian people are not gonna actually be, um, be dangerous um, to you. And I just want to sort of like hot off the presses, point you to this um, amazing um, article, amazing piece of work in scholarship um, by um, Robert Lee, Bobby Lee from Cambridge and Tristan Atone. It's published in High Country News yesterday um, about land grab universities. And basically what they've done is taken a database of Indian land transfers into the public domain, linked it to a database of the US public lands and linked that to a database of moral, uh, Moral Act land grant universities making land claims. And um, it's an amazing, amazing uh, thing to look at. Um, this is going to generate so much conversation around universities in particular. Cornell, it turns out, uh, feasted on native land. University of California, many other institutions sort of survived their first 20 or 30 years on the revenues from native lands. Many universities continue to own native lands and have ongoing revenue coming from these. American Indian land. So this is just part of this kind of settler colonial sort of structure that I just wanted to sort of offer you as a little a little gift. Um, some of these, as, I, as, I, see the, I see the question coming up. Um, some of these yeah. schools do. University of South Dakota, for example, uh, still has native lands revenues. I, my understanding is that they've taken that money and sort of set it aside to actually serve their native student population. <laughs> of course, whether that was a budget sort of shift or an actual sort of, you know, that's that's another question. Um, Cornell, absolutely not. One of the things that shows up in the story is they called Cornell and Cornell said, yeah, no comment. It's a busy time for us um, right now. Brown um, and Yale actually show up, interestingly, Ivy League um, institutions. So this is a future conversation, I think, that's gonna play out um, a lot. I've been thinking a lot about this myself here at Harvard, that, you know, Harvard has definitely uh, sort of in the same ways profited, that it has profited off slavery has profited off native lands. So I think one of the things we can see, imagine in universities over the next few years, is that the um, universities and slavery kinds of conversations will also now have a universities and native lands conversation um, element to them, I think. Andy, that was, you were pointing me to the question, I think, right? I was, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so two master ideologies that show up everywhere. Um, I think underpin these kinds of sifting sort of processes um, which transferred land from native people to the United States and then to its citizens. The first is of course this familiar notion of manifest destiny that you know God just really really wanted the United States to take over the entire continent. And the second is the corollary this sort of vanishing Indian um, sort of idea that just by a law of nature as Joseph Story said in 1828 they just seemed destined to a slow but sure extinction 
Everywhere at the approach of the white man, I, this is a crazy quote, everywhere at the approach of the white man, they fade away. We hear the rustling of their footsteps like that of the withered leaves of autumn and they are gone forever. They pass mournfully by us and they return and no more. Um, so this is when you see these kinds of images of Indians sort of fading and disappearing, this is part of sort of the vanishing Indian ideology that they just disappear. There's no agency there. Nobody kills them or removes them or anything like that, right? So we could choose a number of routes into a discussion of these kinds of ideologies. Um, and I don't claim that my choice is the best, but I want to sort of light for a couple moments on the writer James Fenimore Cooper, uh, author of 1826, the famous Last of the Mohicans, and then the painter George Catlin, who traveled a huge circuit, continental when he was painting Indians, and then global, actually, while he was um, exhibiting his, uh, his work. Both of them represented this sort of complicated ideological mix that we've been talking about, affection and distaste, identification, repulsion, these kinds of things. So Last Mohicans was one of the most popular novels in the 19th century, um, as we know. And Cooper, interestingly, one of the most important figures in the struggle for American writers to actually hold their own copyright and make a living from their, uh, from their writing. The book inspired and influenced many other forms of popular culture. Here, the great Hudson River Valley painter, Thomas Cole, um, who painted three Last of the Mohican scenes in 1827, almost immediately after reading the book. He just got out the easel and started um, painting. So Mark Twain made fun of it. I don't know about you all, but I never had to read Last of the Mohicans. I just got to read Mark Twain's sort of thing making fun of it. Uh, Nathaniel Wyeth, among others, painted cover art, illustrations. It's been made into four films, including the great 1992 version starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Madeline Stowe, Wes Studi, and the American Indian Movement stalwart Russell Means. And that's one of the clips that I had um, sort of put out there for you to take a look at. So Cooper's story has savage Indians, right, the evil Magua, and has good Indians, the noble Uncas and his father, Chingachgook. It's set in 1757 on the colonial frontier during the French and Indian War. Uncas, Chingachgook, and the colonial backwoodsman Hawkeye are attempting to bring to safety the two daughters of the British Colonel Monroe. And so there's a blonde daughter, Alice, who is the very white product of Colonel Monroe's second marriage. And then there's the dark haired Cora, who in the book is the quietly mixed race daughter of his first wife who was a mulatto woman linked to Monroe's service in the Caribbean. So this is an interesting kind of racial dynamic then that Cooper um, sets up. There's no time for a close reading of this novel, but suffice it to say, the plot is driven structurally by the possibility of romantic union, that is of marriage and procreation uh, for the future. And so I invite you to sort of make a quick comparison uh, between the book, as I've outlined it quickly here, and the film. So in Cooper's novel, the fragile, frail, womanly Alice Blonde is loved by the sturdy British officer, Duncan Hayward. And then there's the constant play uh, uh, on the possibility that the dark haired and also sturdy Cora might make a good match for Uncas, right? These are two people of color sort of, you know, being matched up together. And that of course would be a very good thing for the Mohicans because it turns out that Uncas is the last of the Mohicans, right? He needs to create new Mohicans. There needs to be marriage and procreation and children and a future, right? But that's not gonna happen because um, of course of this ideology of the vanished Indian that's everywhere. But what's interesting to me is that the way the argument gets made in Cooper's book and Mann's film tells us about the endurance of this sort of figure of uh, the vanishing, uh, the vanishing Indians. So if you think to the film and think back how it um, actually uh, uh, sort of appears, I'm going to chart out a little bit of the difference here. So for Cooper, America's future is in the hands of upper class British people of genteel manners and origins. But for Michael Mann, if you sort of think about who survived and who didn't. America's future is not in their hands. It's in the hands of sturdy, mixed up, backwoods, lower class pioneers. And in fact, in Mann's film, Hawkeye actually kills Duncan. It's an act of mercy, but he is sort of the source of, of, of Duncan's death. Cooper doesn't want to have anything to do with these frontier people. So at the end of his book, he will banish Hawkeye to the West. 
too contaminated by his associations with Indians. There's no place for him in the New America. He will go west with Chingachgook. All right, so they are sort of paired up together. No future though, right? No children. Man embraces the frontier, but it's important to note, he doesn't really embrace the Indians who go with it. Uncas is dead, um, killed by Magua, and Chingachgook departs westward alone. The final scene of this film, I think it's just really quite striking, moves from a kind of two shot, right, of uh, Hawkeye and Chingachgook together doing this kind of funeral ceremony for Uncas. If you remember this thing, they're holding out, you know, they're throwing seeds in the air, these kinds of things. Cora is off alone. Um, and then there's a sort of cut where Cora and Hawkeye end up together. And then there's a sort of three shot where it looks like all three of them are together and that there's going to be the three of them, you know, kind of united together. And then the camera pulls away and what we see is that Chingachgook is standing alone, right? Separated out from everyone else. No future, no part of this, right? So what's interesting, different form, right? Different plot structure, same conclusion, right? Indians will disappear, Indians will die off, Indians will vanish. This is part of the erasures, right, of settler colonialism. So um, if we look at, uh, oh, there we, here, here we, I, I skipped a slide. You can see how the sort of camera is moving away in that sort of last shot. You can see how Chingachgook is gonna end up, you know, on his own solo. So George Catlin, writing letters from the mouth of Yellowstone in 1832, uh, explained his artistic mission right, in two kind of breathlessly long sentences. I'll just let you read here. So Indians are just going, right? But what does Cooper or what does Catlin see himself doing? I have flown to their rescue, not of their lives, forget that, or their race, no, they are doomed and they must perish. But I've flown to the rescue of their looks and their modes, right? At which the acquisitive world, blah, 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 blah. Yet Phoenix-like, they will rise from the stain on the painter's palette and live again on canvas. Uh, for centuries to come, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So for Catlin, Indians seem constantly to just sort of sink into the earth, being plowed under by civilized farmers. Sinking and plowing are these metaphors that he uses all the time. And white Americans like Catlin would certainly regret Indian passing, but you notice how he sort of says, look, I'm powerless to stop it, it's the law of nature. But what's really important here, I think, is that Catlin altered this rhetoric of disappearance in important ways that point us to our own sort of modern moments. Uh, he also, while insisting on Indian doom, he criticized society and civilization. He called it a poisoning, trampling, crushing agent of destruction, right? So he's critiquing his own society. And before native disappearance came to pass, he said, Indian people would have to bear the further indignity of social and cultural corruption at the hands of Americans. In other words, contact with civilization would change them for the worst. They would come in contact with all the immoral elements of societies um, on the frontier zone, and they would lose the morality that made them noble and the customs that demonstrated their cultural purity. Um, and I think this is mostly encapsulated in an image that I bet you've seen before, um, this sort of thing, we jun jun, the pigeon's egghead, going to and returning from Washington, D.C. He's pure and noble. As he goes to Washington, D.C., you can see the Capitol just there on the left side. Um, he returns home, not enlightened, but as a kind of degraded wretch, liquor bottles uh, stuck in, uh, you know, peeking out of his pocket, cigarette, dressed like a dandy, all of these kinds of things. So this is the problem for Catlin, right? How do you save Indians who are gonna be corrupted by American society? And he proposed to remedy the situation by painting Indians collecting as many likenesses as he possibly could, and thus preserving um, vanishing Indians in representational forms. So in his vision, you can see here, he, this is very sort of, um, Indians are all stunned by his magic of painting. He's wearing his hunting cap because he is literally out hunting Indians. Um, here they are. He's not a great artist, but these are really important kinds of records, um, Native people. So in his vision, they would sit side by side as they are here in the Renwick Gallery, um, each face representing countless Indians that Catlin had been unable to paint. I actually saw this exposition um, 
uh, and it was completely unnerving, right, to see all these heads, kind of trophy heads on the on the walls. But like Michael Mann's film, this same strategy of representation has actually lived on, in this case, in the National Museum of the American Indian and in some of its inaugural galleries um, where it shows up um, as well. So Catlin's story matters um, for a number of reasons. He wasn't the first, but he was the most prolific of a whole series of artists who wanted to create images of Indians, portraiture collections. So Charles Bird King on the left, beginning in the, 19, the 1820s, who painted delegations to Washington, D.C. for over two decades. James Otto Lewis here on the right, whose Aboriginal portfolio was a sort of commercial market good um, for sale to the public. Um, Elbridge Ayer Burbank had painted over 1,200 Indian portraits in the late 19th and 20th century. And then this painting tradition made its way into the photographic tradition. Alexander Gardner, um, sort of famous Civil War photographer, and other mid-century studio photographers who recorded Indians all over the place. This figure on the left, Sasue, Francois de Laurier, is my uh, great-great-grandfather. Um, and I just recently found out that Alexander Gardner did not take that photo, but it was on a delegation to Washington, D.C. And this leads us to, on the right, Edward S. Curtis, right? These sepia tone kinds of um, images, which we see all the time, um, nostalgic, dominating the American cultural uh, imaginary. But Catlin also points us in other directions. While he was in London, uh, his audiences started to dwindle and he started getting the idea about performing, uh, dressing up his nephew and uh, hiring Indians who were already over there. And in this sense, we can see him as the forerunner of the Wild West show, um, one of the most important cultural forms that takes Indians to and puts them in front of the American uh, public. Before I go there, though, I want to just sort of gesture really quickly to two other genres. The first, the stage play, and this this play, Metamora, um, uh, commissioned in 1829 by uh, the guy on the right, Edwin Forrest, uh, one of the most important stage actors. This was performed hundreds of thousands of times over and over and over again. And it's got the same kind of settler colonial dynamic we've been talking about. At the very last scene, Metamora dies and sort of is gasping and says, I die, I, I, I give you my land, take it, and go and live well and prosper, ah, and dies, right? I mean, so the messaging here is not subtle. Uh, second form would be sort of poetry and particularly the epic poem and particularly Longfellow's 1855 Song of Hiawatha, um, which shows up everywhere. School kids memorized it, railroad lines, other literature, painting, toys, etc., etc. It was meant to serve as a, an expression of the indigenous roots of the nation. So it includes banishing ideology as well as the kind of melting pot thing um, that we'll see showing up in the um, in the early 20th century. And here you can see some, just some of the kind of uh, uh, character of Song of Hiawatha, which most people sort of know. I'm always struck by the last couple of lines, which take me back to that quote I read earlier from Joseph's story about Indians sort of vanishing like the withered leaves of autumn, autumn kind of blowing away into the, uh, into the distance. So in the late 19th century, the final conquest of Indian people came into view and then was brought to fruition usefully marked by the 1890 Wounded Knee Massacre, white Americans began to display a kind of ambivalence about closing the curtain on the area of the Indian Wars and banishing Indians. It's what Renato Rosaldo has called imperialist nostalgia, the sort of longing for the thing which you have taken over and kind of dominated. And so what happens is a transformation of the sort of settler colonial kinds of dynamics and the dynamics that I talked about in relation to the, the revolution. When Americans are freaked out by modernity, um, too many people, too many machines, too urban, too far removed from nature, too little spirituality, too much city, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. It should come as no surprise that Indians are once again gonna be mobilized in American culture to make sense of these anxieties. And one of the great anxieties here took form around child rearing. The closing of the frontier, supposedly, the flood of new immigrants, that old kind of experience, Turnerian and, and Teddy Roosevelt, you know, kind of like of becoming American while carving out primitive country and surviving Indian attacks, those things are no longer available to American children. This is what people said. So how could you raise hardy American kids in the suburbs? Ah, be an Indian, of course. This is what all the kids are doing. The boys know no greater delight than to play Indian. The girls dress up like Red Wing and many ha-ha these kinds of things. So organizations like 
Ernest Thompson Seton's Woodcraft Indians and the Campfire Girls both imagined new kinds of Indians um, here. Uh, like their revolutionary forefathers, they acted out their, their ideas in costume play. So one of the texts that I also um, uh, added into the mix here was uh, the first birch bark roll of Woodcraft Indians. And you can see when Ernest Thompson Seton sort of is writing here, uh, uh, I'll just read quickly. This is a time when the whole nation is turning toward the outdoor life, seeking in it the physical regeneration so needful for continued national existence, et cetera, et cetera. And he makes this argument, right, that getting outside is really important, that sport is the way to do it, that nature study is the best articulation of sport, and that camping is really the way to do nature study. And there's four different models we might choose from, and one's military, and one's schooling, and one's Indian, and it's the best. And so there's a whole kind of argument that gets made in the early 20th century about child rearing by getting kids to be dressed up like Indians and regress back to a kind of primitive social stage, then work their way through social evolutionary stages so that they can actually be um, modern and contemporary. So if we think about how this plays out, we can see that like it's flip-flopping what had happened uh, before. The Indians that once hated, that Americans once hated, had been the savage and distant Indians. They'd built national identities uh, on this noble Indian, so close to the continent, the essence of America. But now the savage Indian was the one who had assimilated into white American culture, what George Catlin feared. In doing so, that Indian figure had lost nobility, succumbed to the worst features of modernity, so American, so modern, likely to be represented as a degraded drunk lying in a gutter. So when we think about that particular strand of imagery of negative Indian drunkenness, it comes out of this particular moment, I think. But then there was this noble Indian, the one to be emulated, who remained wild and untamed and authentic and real. And that was the Indian who generations of modern Americans would make their own through things like campfire, Boy Scouts, YMCA, Indian guides, sports mascots, new age sweat lodge ceremonies, etc. Well, the great um, irony uh, to be found in that admonition to be an Indian is its author was in fact a native person, the Seneca Museum anthropologist and political activist, Arthur C. Parker. Uh, and this points to a final set of arguments I want to make today, which can be found in this other book, Indians in Unexpected Places. Uh, but to get there, I want to backtrack really quickly to the 19th century, to the dime novel tradition, and particularly to those starring Buffalo Bill Cody. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, these dime novels, inexpensive little things that proliferated, um, spread images of Indian savagery and nobility and disappearance across the country. But what's interesting you know, to me is what Cody did with them. Drawing on the traditions of the theatrical stage and exhibitions like Catlin's, Cody formed what he called the Buffalo Bill Combination, which actual Western scouts, here he is with Wild Bill Hickok and Texas Jack Amohundro, would reenact on stage supposed actual Western scenes. So then Cody took this the next step further, combining this dramatization with rodeo games and with the traveling infrastructure created by railroads and trailblazed by circuses, created the Wild West Show, um, <clears throat> which was one of the most dominant forces in American cultural history in any time or place, right, in our national history. You can see uh, the scale of the thing. Oh, maybe I missed that one. Yes, I seem to. Um, this was like, it's hard to realize how large this thing was. He had bleachers that could accommodate 11,000 people per show. The stage set stretched for you know blocks and blocks. You know it was huge. So he insisted this was an educational experience, and he made that argument by pointing to the authenticity of the cast and the props. So the Deadwood stage that got attacked by Indians that was like the real Deadwood stage that you know they kind of took from South Dakota and brought back into the show. The cowboys were real. The horses were real. The bison were real. And the most real thing out there, the thing that made the Wild West so appealing, were the real Indians. Now, Cody's show ran for almost 30 years. And though he hired a range of Indian people, uh, he came quickly to, real, uh, to rely upon an annual job fair at the Pine Ridge Lakota Reservation. So each spring, Cody would hire between 75 and 100 Lakota people 
to work in his show. They traveled across the country on Cody's uh, tours of Europe. Uh, some of them, Red Shirt, who's the figure shown there on the left, the very handsome guy, um, became established with the show, returned for many, many seasons. Down in the right corner, Luther Standing Bear was a translator um, for Cody and then would later make his way into the, into the film world. So these are native people who are engaged with the sort of modern world of uh, uh, travel and wage labor performance. They're super cosmopolitan. Um, they traveled through cities, they, they toured Europe. There's interesting moments when they left the show. Um, uh, two Indians uh, who uh, sort of left the show while it was in Europe, traveled through Russia, ended up in Australia. Um, I mean, so these were cosmopolitan world travelers jumping into modernity um, really without flinching. And I think it's really important to think about that. So the Wild West then points us in two different directions um, for American culture. First, you can draw a direct line between the Wild West and early filmmaking. When the Wild West shows finished their seasons, they were left with an expensive plant that sat idle for several months. In the early 20th century, filmmaking was first developing as a commercial art um, and many of the storylines that were being converted from print narratives into film were those found in the old dime novels and the Wild West show itself. So it took no great leap of imagination to understand that the capital investments of the shows, wagons, horses, bison, stages, cabins, and actors could be put to good use during the Wild West show off season as film props. In other words, Wild West helped give direction to a great deal of early filmmaking. And it's not by accident that the Western and the Western featuring Indians became one of the dominant genre forms up through the 1960s. Second, many Indian actors also followed a straight line from the Wild West out to California and to new work in the film industry. Um, so this Camp of Teepees that you see up in the upper right-hand corner, there near Santa Monica, a place called Inceville. Thomas Ince, film producer, had a whole camp. So when Arthur C. Parker observed that girls love to dress up as Red Wings, he was referring to a real person, Princess Red Wing, the first American Indian film star. With her somewhat sketchy husband, James Young Deer, Red Wing starred in a number of early silent films. And indeed, the two of them wrote, directed, uh, and produced as well, creating films that challenged many of the stereotypical images that we've been watching. So here's this moment, I mean, Andy, it goes back to the sort of first question that you ask, how are Native people sort of engaging with American culture in this sense? When they have opportunities, as Young Deer and Red Wing did, to seize the means of production, in this case, of film production, um, it's pretty interesting to look at their films, uh, which don't allow Indian people to die, which allow cross-racial romance to happen, um, which offer critiques of white um, settlers and civilization. What's also interesting is these films um, with their critical messages actually didn't really tend to attract much of an audience and the me mechanisms right, of cultural production and film financing didn't allow them really to sustain, uh, to sustain this. Um, so Arthur, like Arthur Parker, um, uh, and his sort of complicated but bizarre admonition to kids to be Indian, the work that uh, folks like Young Deer and Red Wing did um, faced real limits, right, to how much they could, could challenge. These Native people really had to perform Indian, to play Indian themselves for their white audiences, to be visible, to be taken seriously as Native people. And so that dynamic, like look at me, and then now listen to what I say, also meant reinforcing some expectations, even as they called others into, into question. Um, for folks who are interested in using film, I highly recommend this, if you can get a hold of it. You can buy it online, The Silent Enemy from 1930. It's a silent film, although the very beginning of it, Chauncey Yellow Robe, um, who was a very important Native activist in the early 20th century, worked a lot with the YW, YMCA and the YWCA, um, does a sort of speaking introduction. Filmed on location in Canada um, with really interesting characters. Chauncey Yellow Robe is one. Uh, Molly Spotted Elk, who was sort of the Indian Josephine Baker, uh, sort of cabaret dancer, you know, went to Paris, et cetera, et cetera. And then this character on the far left, Buffalo Child Longlance, um, who was basically a native imposter um, who built a whole career around bodybuilding. He was outed as being not non-native, um, committed suicide. So the characters in this film are absolutely fascinating for conversations about race, 
about modernity and about how we think about these kinds of things. So I really just want to um, recommend this. I teach this film on a fairly regular uh, basis. So after a couple centuries during which Indian people had been implanted into American cultural imaginations in all these ways, non-Indians had developed a set of expectations that continue to structure the ways that Indians appear in both cultural texts and white American consciousness. So I focused on the visual and the literary, um, uh, but just to take another example that, that leads us back to share, um, that you can actually imagine this in sonic terms as well, not just literary terms, not just ideological terms, that da -da -da -da, short long rhythm gives you this sort of picture of Indians. And what you find is that there are lots and lots of native musical performers, a very, very long tradition, um, who also did the same kind of thing, would sort of perform those expectations, the sonic expectations, um, and then try to convince people otherwise. So people like Princess Chenina, uh, Asuka Nantan, Irene Eastman, they would sing those notes dun, 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 in order to be recognized. And then they would oftentimes turn and put on formal wear and sing opera, right, or sing popular music. Um, this might take some of you, if you've seen the film Rumble, a uh, sort of really powerful statement about the native roots of so much uh, of our music. Uh, so these were all efforts on the part of native people to complicate the mental pictures of Indians that floated in the minds of their audiences. And you could say something similar about the proliferation of Indian athletes in the early 20th century. Um, just because I like to throw these family pictures in, the sort of figure um, down in the lower center is my grandfather, honorable mention, all-American football player in 1922 at what is now Bard College. Um, see Jim Thorpe over on the right, uh, Louis Tewanima, uh, Hopi runner, Chief uh, Charles Albert Chief Bender um, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Lots and lots of these native athletes sort of doing similar kinds of things. You could also say the same thing about folks like Will Rogers, uh, Rosebud Yellow Robe, Maria Tallchief, uh, the other Indian great ballerinas of the mid 20th century, the art and design leader, Lloyd Kivanu, um, say something similar about the activists at Wounded Knee. Uh, um, uh, and Alcatraz, sorry, excuse me, at, at Alcatraz or Wooden Knee, other moments in the politics uh, of culture that characterized so much of the 1960s and 70s, right? See me, I'm native, understand this, listen to me uh, as I say something, um, and then understand also the ways that white audiences see those headdresses and take certain other kinds of, uh, certain other kinds of things going on. So um, I want to move to close then with a really uh, sort of quick example of some of the work that I've just been doing lately um, around my great aunt, uh, sort of unknown Dakota artist, Mary Sully. Um, between 1927 and uh, 19, the mid-1940s, she did 134 of these kinds of images. She called them personality prints. Um, she is, I argue, in, in, in my, my latest book, um, Becoming Mary Sully, sort of the first Indian woman in on modernity, and she's in on modernist painting um, long before the sort of more famous native men of the Institute of American Indian Arts of the 50s and, and 60s. Um, uh, and she creates these really interesting kinds of things. Here, um, I think she believes the stories that, that are told in the first panels of, if you look on the left, the side um, here. These things were to be stacked, they were stacked vertically and they were taped together. Um, the top image was meant to sort of, uh, or in this case the left image, meant to sort of produce the middle image, meant to produce the, the right image. So one of the things you can see when you look at this is evocations of Diego Rivera and muralists in that sort of segmented structure. If those of you know the work of Aaron Douglas, the sort of silhouetted figures so key to African-American, kinds of modernist arts um, to, to Kara Walker, from Aaron Douglas to Kara Walker. You can see those kinds of things. But there's a narrative here, right, that moves from uh, sort of a pure in native life at the bottom, uh, characterized by greens and different other kinds of colors, to the desperation of the reservation and the trials of modernity. Literally at the top of the image there on the left, you can see the feet of modern industrial America sort of pressing down on these Indian figures who are trying to create and imagine another life for themselves. That image then gets converted in the second panel. Each of those bands gets converted into an iconographic figure. Um, and you can see this sort of band of color 
that is meant to represent the native sort of uh, kind of parts of the image. And then in the left, or the far right rather, you can see the ways that all of those things now get turned into a really interesting kind of abstract kind of pattern. The central band down the middle, red, yellow, blue, green, these are the colors of parflesh painting, a kind of native uh, women's art form uh, from the Great Plains. And that that is the center that centers everything uh, that the native sort of emerges as the most important thing that's going on here. So she distills these things down into a political kind of claim and turns her work back to the native, uh, native kind of world. And that takes us to sort of how we might think about, oops. Andy, do we miss the survivance slide maybe? Uh, you know what, I thought I had put it, but it made, all right, everybody close your eyes. So let's go forward just for a minute and see where it is. I think I put it at the very end. I'm sorry. I think I, I saw the I saw a different Mary Sully image at the very end. Uh, you know, yeah, because I had a bunch of extras in there. Well, yeah. we can just sort of talk through this really quickly. I mean, one of the things I asked you to sort of take a look at was just a one page um, piece of writing by Gerald Visner, um, where he talks about survivance. And this has been sort of, if we're thinking about how native people have talked about this and tried to theorize this, Visner's idea of survivance has been really an important idea, I think, for me and for many other folks in this kind of realm. And, and what he says is like, survivance is a native estate. He uses really complicated language and it's, it's very evocative, right? But he says it's about presence, not absence. Where the settler colonial would make native people absent and erased, survivance, through telling stories, through irony, through twists and turns, through always insisting on being visible and being present, right, is about native survival. So resistance is survival. Survival is resistance. Um, and so survivance ends up being this sort of moment, uh, theoretical kind of way of thinking about native people like all the folks I've just talked about in the last couple of, of slides, right, who are crafting worlds for themselves which are native worlds, um, in the midst of all of this kind of cultural baggage that ends up surrounding them. So when you compare that kind of work, um, and in this case, I would particularly point you to the 1491's video, um, uh, which is, I think, a really great example of sort of native irony, of native in-your-faceness. Um, uh, if you think about that video, uh, I'm an Indian too, one of the first things that's happening is they're taking this one of these quintessentially white forms um, this song that was in um, Annie Get Your Gun. Most high schools, high schools don't actually do that song in, when they do that musical anymore. Um, I know this because my daughter, my daughter's high school actually decided to do Annie Get Your Gun, which is a terrible show for a high school. Um, I protested this with the principal and this show, song was not in it, but like the Chippewa, da, 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 I'm an Indian too, right? So it captures, that song captures everything that we've been talking about tonight. And what the 1491s do, this native comedy troupe, is to seize that back and to tell their own kinds of stories, right? To make fun of it on the one hand. But when you look at that video, what you also see is a whole homage to beautiful native people, right? Fantastically wonderful folks. Um, yes, uh, I'm just looking at Stephanie Nero's question. Gerald Visner, when we're talking about survivance, right? Anishinaabe sort of uh, writer, theorist, um, really quite amazing person. Um, so the 1491, 92s actually sort of take, so funny, 1491s actually take this and cutting uh, the figure of Ryan Redcord making fun of the hipsters, like this woman in the headdress. Um, he actually has hipster written across his, uh, his chest. Cutting that and interspersing that with native people living native lives, right? And that's a story, right, about native ongoing agency and sovereignty and, and survivance. So there's irony in there, there's twisting and turning, there's assertion of native life um, uh, going forward, always going forward into futurity. So we see these kinds of stereotyped images and we think, how do native people react and respond to them? They respond with survivance kinds of strategies. So no matter how prevalent the stereotypes and expectations, there are always Indian people, creative people, political people, and just everyday people who have always contested these things, right? Who have used them to create their own sense of identity, their own arts, literatures, musics, images, resistant always in nature, native cultures, right? Ongoing, 
right? in the biggest and the most important sense of the word. Right? So Native people may make up 1.2% of the American population, um, uh, may get 1.2% of uh, attention from the national media, but the fact is Native histories, Native lives, Native political structures, Native realities deserve much more of our time and our attention um, than 1.2%. So, um, Andy, that's kind of where I end. Um, and if there's folks sort of maybe pitching a few last questions, is that kind of maybe a good way that, for us to close? Be, yeah, that'd be fantastic. And while we get there, I'm actually going to forward to what I know to be uh, some slides that I added at the end that might have a survive it. There you go. Ah, there it is. Yeah. Just so it's there because I know Stephanie uh, asked about it. Um, but what kind of questions do you have, uh, folks? We've got a, just a few more minutes if you'd like to ask any clarifying questions or bring uh, your own interest into the conversation. Um, it certainly seems like by starting tonight's converse, uh, talk with this notion of invisibility, what you've outlined is a way to make things visible, right? Is to, is to inflate all those uh, perceptions we have. Um, what kind of questions do we have in the audience, please? This will give you a chance, uh, Professor, to take some water and rest your voice. I am doing that right now. <laughs> Uh, so Elizabeth uh, Grossi asks, what's the best thing written for students on Native history and or survivance, uh, high school, lower high school? Oh, you know, this is a really hard question, right? I mean, um, I know the go-to for many folks has been Sherman Alexie's um, autobiography, you know, of a, and I'm not going to get the title quite right, but I, I, autobiography of a, of a true authentic Indian. Um, you know, of course, Sherman Alexie has, has, you know, sort of uh, been a sort of me too first person um, in some pretty egregious ways. And I actually don't teach Sherman Alexie myself um, any anymore. Tommy Orange's uh, book is really probably too challenging and too hard um, for those um, for those students. Um, I, I am probably inclined to push back to a really classic um, book, uh, Black Elk Speaks. Um, which is an interesting book that, that opens up to a whole bunch of different kinds of teaching uh, possibilities. Um, yeah, someone is mentoring uh, uh, Louise Erdrich. These are fan, I mean, she's an amazing uh, writer. I mean, her books tend to be uh, really long and in that sense sort of um, challenging to sort of think about how we teach. Um, for those who are adventurous, Tommy Orange's book is pretty interesting. Um, I, uh, uh, I taught it last, uh, last year. Um, hey, Patricia Highland. Yeah, I mean, I, Six Grandfather is actually the um, the sort of original sort of transcripts that Ray DeMalley actually puts uh, uh, sort of framing around Black Elk Speaks. But I think Black Elk Speaks is one of those texts that um, uh, is not to be sort of read as like the literal kind of this is the best statement, but like this is an interesting text that we have to unpack. What is the relationship between John Nyhart and Black Elk? How does a literary text get written? What are the forms of Black Oak's own sort of Christian life that sort of make their way into the text? So it opens up in all kinds of um, ways like that. Yeah, I'm seeing people sort of suggesting maybe Tommy Orange for high school seniors. Um, you know, I could I could kind of see that. And as you can see, we've got uh, questions starting to flow in. I appreciate everybody's thoughts. Maria Blake is asking about graphic novels. Um, some other suggestions by Patrick Highland and, and Julie Goodspeed Chadwick. Uh, yeah. Selena asks, here, here's a question for you. Selena asks, why do you think the aesthetics of the Wild West and portrayals of American Indians found in them persist in the cultural imagination of the 21st century? For example, Westworld's Ghost Nation, Rango, Lone Ranger, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think those are just really super powerful kinds of uh, aesthetic forms that have embodied themselves, embedded themselves. The, the, the sort of move from, you know, 19th century dime novel, super popular, to Wild West show, super popular, to film, super popular, that's a hundred years worth of sort of embeddedness of that particular kind of form and those in particular kinds of um, tropes and stories and narratives. Um, so it's easy to see why that actually creates a sort of cultural canon, you know, a sort of thing that can be drawn upon um, completely. Um, Indigenous People's History of the U.S. Um, yeah, absolutely happy to recommend that. Um, Radical Hope by Jonathan Lear, really interesting um, kind of book from a philosopher. Um, 
Uh, there's some folks who have had some, you know, kind of trouble with that. I found it really, really interesting, um, sort of thinking about like what happens when the world ends, but it doesn't really um, end. Um, yeah. What I'm also noticing and, um, is that as a professor of history, you're talking an awful lot about literature and culture and film and art. Do you find that those are useful vehicles for teaching in the history department? Yeah, I mean, I'm an American studies person. Um, so I actually teach two different courses. I teach a sort of flat out history and politics class. Um, where we do a lot of work on treaties um, and law and politics. And then I teach a studies course where we do a frame around law and politics. And then we move to literature, music, art, food, um, you know, global indigenous kinds of things. Um, and I actually do find that teaching these things are really, really useful. I, one of the things I do is I ask students to do a 10 song native mixtape um, and they come up with amazing, amazing native music um, from around the world and from all kinds of places that, um, you know, they, they sort of like get me started for each, uh, each year. Um, question to Carl about the searchers. Um, I actually don't teach that um, because I think that that film is is just too much. Um, I'm not saying I never would, um, uh, but if you're going to watch that, I mean it has that that film has to that requires a huge amount of I think work you know to unpack it. Big yes to Deborah Miranda's Bad Indians um, as well. Um, brand new book I would just also recommend Beth Piatote's uh, book The Bead Workers. Um, it's lovely um, poetry and uh, and prose. Yes, Yellow Raft in Blue Water. Um, also, really, that's a great book for thinking about sort of native and Afro-native kinds of things. And I think that's a super important thing for us to be thinking a lot about going forward. Um, for folks who want to think about sort of more theoretical stuff, there's a brand new book out called The Black Shoals, which puts Native and African American things in dialogue. Um, Ceremony is a fantastic book. Um, really, really fun to teach. Um, yeah, Dances with Wolves didn't dig it so much. Um, but <laughs> although, I mean, it's it's quite interesting, right? That Dances with Wolves actually mobilized a whole series of Native people as you know as actors and advanced their careers. But the structure of the film, interestingly paired with something like Last of the Mohicans, right? You have a white person who gets brought into a Native society, then you have another white person, Kevin Costner, who gets to be more Indian than other Indians at the very end. The two white people are going to mate and marry and get away from the massacre that's coming. And so it's this completely awful kind of conclusion, right, in which white people sort of take from Native culture and society, become authentic, and then take off, you know, and go and do their own thing while Indians die. Uh, smoke signals, thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, Selena says this is our last question, but having worked with her, I know that's not true, and I hope it isn't. Um, a little bit, a little bit of a sideways question. Many at her university, Salida, you're at Arizona or Arizona State, uh, have taken up land acknowledgments. Uh, she's heard about Arizona State. She's heard about uh, there already being a backlash towards this viewing. It simply is lip service. What, what are your thoughts on this and how it's addressed in your department and your university at Harvard? Yeah, I mean it's exactly right. Um, you know. Uh, <clears throat> this can so, and the backlash really has started in Canada. So there's a lot of First Nations folks who have really um, sort of pushed uh, the question about whether these things are actually useful, whether reconciliation is possible, whether this is just something to make white people feel good. Um, I'm not quite there yet myself. Um, I think these are really important kinds of things to do just in the interest of legibility in relation to erasures. But um, if you go to, um, it's the Native Lands Map. Um, which sort of is a really wonderful online resource. Um, it's got a Canadian online address, um, and it allows you to sort of zoom into different kinds of territories and sort of look and see who maybe sort of shows up. Um, but one of the things they say is this is the beginning, not the end of a conversation about this. There's a whole series of very critical resources about it. Um, it's something that is meant to be sort of, yes, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, God, this is great. Um, it's, it's the beginning of a conversation, not the end. Um, I think it's useful um, for folks who have friends or um, people who see how it's done in Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada. You know, these things are all slightly different, uh, but they're all kind of of a piece. And it's pretty, um, 
it's it's pretty instructive. Um, I think I've seen too many of them that sort of take on a kind of um, you know this is a spiritual kind of thing and it's super solemn and 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 there is a solemn kind of quality to it but it is educational fundamentally what i've asked my students and colleagues and peers to do is to sort of if there is a chance to sort of take your land acknowledgement into the intellectual work that you're doing on that particular day or that particular moment um, this is a really good thing so i have a student chloe chapin who is working on the history of the tuxedo and you would not think that that would be a good occasion for this, but in fact, she does a really wonderful land acknowledgement about the landscape of Tuxedo, New York, um, puts Native people into it. Um, and, and so those kinds of things, I think, are ways forward around land acknowledgements, um, but it's a tricky kind of thing. Fantastic. I've got one last question for you. Um, and it, it really, I think, <clears throat> maybe invites you to talk a little bit about geography, not of, not of, the native peoples being represented, but of those who uh, who interpret it. So, you know, we we've sort of talked in these big general terms. Do you get any sense that there's a a difference in the geography of of America of of how these uh, appro misappropriations are taken? I I grew up in Tidewater, Virginia, Chesapeake Bay region. Everything is Pocahontas, John Smith. Um, being able to compare some of the, those uh, attributions to the John White watercolors was always really powerful. But what, what's it like in other parts? Are there other parts of the country where that is more or or different? Um, I mean, I think absolutely yes, right? I mean, it's interesting being in New England, and it's especially interesting right now as uh, Wampanoag, Mashpee Wampanoags have, um, you know, sort of been threatened, well, are losing their their tribal, uh, the designation of their land as trust territory. Um, here in New England, there's a kind of warm, fuzzy thanksgiving -y kind of thing that pops up um, and a sort of denial of other sort of Native people in the South where, um, you know, uh, in the places of Indian removal, I think it's much easier to commemorate things. I think out in the West where there are many, many more Native people present, the forms of racism are more on the surface. Um, there's less of this kind of happy commemorative sort of um you know stuff going on so i think geographically it really does matter and i think that fits within a meta picture which is i mean i have been really struck as a person from colorado um you know and the sort of northern great plains um moved to michigan full of anishinaabe people um and then to you know massachusetts sort of just seeing the difference between what i would think of as a kind of california style ethnic studies in which you know Native, African American, Asian, Latinx, Hispanic kinds of um, uh, sort of dialogue is much, much more present than the East Coast. It's very, very much more of an African American centric, uh, you know, kind of thing. So I think there's geographical kind of stuff that um, happens, you know, there as well. Great. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for your thoughts tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate your insights, and um, and thank you for joining us. Hey, it was my pleasure. Um, it, thanks for uh, inviting me. It's a little bit of an odd form. I hope it was okay. Um, I certainly had fun doing it and I appreciate everybody's time. And I wanna thank all of our uh, attendees and our audience tonight for joining us. A couple of quick reminders. Um, we do record each of the webinars and post them on our website, usually within about 48 hours. So you can go back to the National Humanities Center uh, website uh, to the webinar registration page and the registration button gets toggled to recording. And so if you'd like to go back and linger with the conversation tonight, maybe find uh, bits of it that you'd like to share with your students or review some of the many wonderful resources and titles and authors that will be online and available uh, very soon. And as I mentioned earlier, you'll be able to uh, search your website to find that as well. Um, I also would uh, suggest that tonight, and I, I, I would say that tonight's chat was very robust. There were wonderful suggestions. Many of you are bringing titles and authors in. Uh, but I do find that the recording doesn't capture the chat. So what you might do as I'm wrapping things up is take your, your cursor and run up the chat box and save that entire chat. Uh, just hit save and then put it into a Word document and go back and find some of those suggestions that you shared with each other. I'm going to save it as well and we'll try to make it available. But if you want to make sure you capture what everybody else has been sharing, go ahead and, and save, that, uh, save that tonight. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds, both Twitter and Facebook. We do tend to do, this spring, we've been doing a lot of pop-up webinars. 
that are designed to provide resources, not only in the online teaching environment, uh, but to help us understand this sort of complex world that we're in. I know we have at least one more coming up um, in the next couple of days, and the ways that you can hear about that are through social media and through our email listserv. So if you haven't signed up for that email listserv, you can go to our webinar page and do that as well. Um, and that's something that we release uh, sort of by the hour, and uh, to date, uh, our pop-ups have, have filled usually within just a couple, three hours. So um, if you're interested, I'd love to give you the opportunity to sign up. Please also join us uh, at our next scheduled webinar. Uh, this is on April the 9th. We'll be working with Elliot West, I suspect a friend of uh, Dr. Deloria's. His title tonight will be The Other American Revolution, The Rise of Horse Cultures in the American West and the Transformation of Native America. That's scheduled for next, um, next week, April the 9th. In just a moment, I am going to uh, close the room and I'm gonna launch our end of uh, session survey. Once you complete that, you'll be able to download your certificate of attendance and uh, document your, your presentation tonight. Thank you again so much. Please be well. Uh, please pull your, your students as close as you can through Zoom. Uh, let us know how we can help. Uh, we'll see you next time at the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.